So yeah, what I'll try to do today is I will um, talk a little bit about my lab's experience using systems level analyses to monitor immune systems. So um, this is an image of Sweden in the summer, middle of the night, just so you guys know. Um, it's a pretty nice place to be. Um, and there's also a good, it's also a good place for science. So um, I'm one of many doing uh, in monitoring of immune systems in humans. So uh, I don't have all the answers here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about my experiences and our team's experiences. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we see these analyses of immune systems in humans moving into patients and, and how some of the lessons we've learned, I should say, um, over the years. So the first question, obviously, is why should we be studying humans in general when uh, mice are so much easier, right? Um, you can get a new one if your experiment fails. Um, but um, the reason, you know, one of the main reason for me, at least, is that any finding in humans would be immediately relevant to humans. Um, whether it be, you know, applicable to all humans is another question, but at least it's immediately relevant. And so um, that, I think, is the key point for me, at least as a physician. Humans live in a dirty world with a bunch of microbes and pollutants and other things. It's a really complicated uh, environment to study. Humans are also obviously very diverse genetically. So it, there are definitely challenges in studying humans. Um, but, the, but the gain, the possible rewards are also great. Um, so how, then, should we do this? And, and this is, again, our experiences. There are many experts here who can tell you other things. And I hope this meeting will be a good place for us to discuss sort of the best ways to do this. Um, I'm going to focus entirely on blood, because that's what we do. Um, and others can talk about how to study specific tissues, which is a whole other um, complication and, and challenge. Anyway, so um, there are some sort of um, general things that I want to bring up. So the first one is that to try to study humans, I think systems level analyses, and I'm explaining that in a minute what I mean by that, has a specific role to play. Every of these cell populations, just in healthy individuals, people in this room, would vary enormously, right, between healthy individuals. Um, therefore, it'd be really complicated to tell something about a disease, health disease, and so on based on individual features. However, the system as a whole is completely integrated. The cells respond uh, in relation to each other. They work together. And when we look at all of them at the same time, patterns start to appear. Um, patterns that we can associate with disease, patterns that maybe underlie disease, perturbations between specific cells, and so on. So that's what I'm trying to highlight with this slide here. The different cells, they're specialized to do different things. They depend upon each other. They communicate by direct interactions, but also by secreting proteins. So to me, systems level analyses mean trying to look at the entire system. As many of these components as we can, cell populations by mass cytometry, for example, which is our favorite method for that, uh, or high dimensional protein analysis, looking at those arrows in between here, using different technologies for that. So that's one, one way to study humans that I think has some important um, advantages. Another thing that we try to do in everything we do, every study that we can impact the design, we always try to promote longitudinal analyses. And again, because humans are so incredibly diverse for various reasons, genetics and environment, by following individuals over time, and in this, this is also where the blood sampling comes in, it's difficult to do with tissue samples, um, but with blood, you can sample routinely, or sort of longitudinally, and measure as many of these components as possible. And when we do that, we start seeing that everyone is their own control, and changes associated with some disease or intervention can be appreciated. Another thing that I think is really powerful with longitudinal analysis is to try to infer relationships between these components. And this, we are just beginning to do this uh, we as a field, um, but I think there's a lot more to do uh, in that respect. All right, so there's some enabling technologies. Mass cytometry is one of them. Um, protein analysis, we can now measure hundreds of plasma proteins very easily and accurately. Uh, we favor a method called Olink um, by a Swedish company, um, which gives very accurate data using dual recognition antibodies and uh, PCR readout. 
And then obviously you all know about the enormous uh, advances made in sequencing technologies, which are now enabling global analysis of nucleic acids, but also cells and, and proteins. But again, let's get back to this issue of how do we study human immune system and how do we tackle some of these challenges I've mentioned. So one thing that we worked quite a bit on uh, in the last few years is to try to minimize every uh, amount of technical variation that we can because we, the argument for that would be that by minimizing the technical variation, we can see more biological variation using the sample sets we have. Um, any sort of technical variation will be blurring our uh, vision otherwise. And so one way to do that is to start moving from PBMCs to whole blood. And this has been instrumental for us. Uh, it's changed everything, in, actually, because by stabilizing whole blood, freezing it after 10 minutes, um, in a, just a 10-minute incubation after blood draw, freezing it, and then thawing it, staining it, and running it as a whole blood sample, as you can see in the top right corner there, or in the middle one, there are two t SNE plots. The top one is from whole blood, um, and the, the bottom one is from PBMC, from the same blood sample. Everybody knows that neutrophils are lost in the PBMC prep, but there are other changes too. And, and most importantly, if we look at the top uh, right corner there in the graph, the variability and the variation here, technical variation, when doing technical replicates from the same blood draw, is much, the technical variation is much greater in PBMC than in whole blood, uh, preserved whole blood, which really um, allows us, when we start moving towards whole blood, not only do we see a more physiological tissue, because PBMC doesn't really exist other than, you know, uh, in a tissue culture dish or tube. And so um, whole blood is more physiological, but it's also less variable for technical reasons. We start seeing more biological signatures that we're interested in. And on the bottom there, we, we compared stimulation experiments. When stimulation is done directly at blood draw using a syringe uh, containing stimulants versus in, in a PBMC culture, there's a lot more variation for technical reasons in the PBMC culture. Again, Minimizing technical variation will, will increase our biological signal. Same here with staining and processing and all these other sources of potential technical variation. Yaramir and my team, who's here at the meeting, has worked really hard on automating the barcoding, the cell staining, and all of that using liquid handling robotics. And that reduces the loss of cells tremendously. We have nearly no cell loss at all anymore. It's never more than 1 or 2%. Um, and, and also the staining is much more reproducible, um, which makes perfect sense. The other thing is that one individual can process 196 samples in a day's time, um, and for example, while running uh, yesterday's samples um, and so on. So that's how we work in the facility, which I'm going to talk more about in the afternoon in this session. Finally, analysis, we can talk about analysis for days, and, and this is just one aspect of it, but manual gating is a very subjective type of analysis, as you all know. So one way to try to reduce variation is to try to automate it, and there are hundreds of tools to do that, clustering tools and so on. But one thing that Yang Chen in my team started playing with, which I think worked out really nicely, was to try to use machine learning to basically learn phenotypes, learn what a T cell of a given type should look like, and then teach an algorithm to recognize it so that when the next experiment was done, it could be automated uh, really quickly. And so he built a software that allows us to gate, and then, now I'm showing you level one, which is the first TSNE map, and the color is CD45, but you can imagine any marker, obviously. Um, and then on this TSNE, or barnes hutzny map, you gate your cells of interest, that would be a level one gating. The algorithm is taught that. We're using five different uh, machine learning algorithms and we choose the best one. Um, and then you go on to level two. And now for the CD4 T cells, for example, you can do another one of these manual gating approaches to generate a training set that you trust. Um, and the algorithm, a new algorithm will be trained and so this can be done in multiple layers. We usually only do these two because then we get something like 40 populations. And now what this allows you to do is to classify hundreds of files in a matter of seconds. So we typically run about 100 files a day or 196 well played. Um, that would be acquired in one day. 
And then in 20 seconds or something, that's all classified and you can have your gated, gated data um, for downstream analysis. So we think this works really well and it's reproducible. Um, the other thing that this does is you can allow, um, by, by looking at the markers, and, and on the left here is a looped analysis where we basically throw one of the markers out and then we redo the classification, in this case level one. And what that allows you to do is to rank the markers on, by importance, right? So you can say that, okay, this particular marker, when I throw that out, the precision of the classification goes down. So that marker is very important. And that gives a score, and to our surprise, the most important marker for level one gating is CD38. The second most important marker, even more surprising, was CD99. You see CD8 is not here. You can throw that out of your panels. You don't need that. Um, CD19, CD20, these are not even on this list. So we think this is also a way to optimize our panels, and we are doing this now for level one, two, and so on. Um, so that we can maybe throw in another marker that will give more information and so on and so forth. All right, uh, this should be out on BioArchive in a couple of weeks or so. The other thing I wanted to talk about is immune variation um, because this is a general sort of backdrop. Whenever we try to study patients, we have to think about how healthy individuals vary. So to get a handle of that, we teamed up with a large group of basically a village of researchers in Sweden looking at uh, healthy individuals in this case, uh, middle-aged, healthy individuals, 50 women and 50 men, followed four times during a year. Um, they're sort of average Swedes in terms of uh, BMI and blood pressure and so on. We profiled them with every technology that we could think of, not we, but the whole village. Um, and so, and this shows the variability here. Each color is an individual, multiple, four different time points. And you can see that the plasma proteome is incredibly stable in case someone doesn't have an infection or something, but otherwise it's very stable. The immune cells, which is the cytome there, varies a little bit more, but many of those individuals are incredibly stable. I'll get back to that. Microbiome, same, same pattern. Most people are very stable. Few of them vary quite drastically. Um, there's some sex differences. Some of these are known, others are not. Um, more naive CD4s in women more activated CD8s in men, for example. But that explains only about 2.4% of the total variance here. So sex has a pretty minor effect on the cell composition here. But when we look at the variation over these four different time points, we can also start to think about, we can quantify how, what distance does a given individual travel over those four different samples. So you can imagine someone having an infection and traveling very far between two distance, two visits but maybe not so much in the others. But there, there seems to be a pattern in which each and every one of these individuals has a unique sort of distance traveled over the course of these four visits. And that's the rank the box plots on the right. And so what correlates with variability? These are all healthy people. None of them have uh, infections to, to our knowledge, at least not that they reported in their extensive questionnaires. Well, it turns out that the most variable individuals are also the individuals with the highest total white count. They have the highest levels of ApoB1 and LDL cholesterol, which is not there in the plot, and they have the lowest levels of HDL, ApoA1, good cholesterol, and so on. So maybe there is a link here between metabolic health and, and variability. We think uh, it hints towards that, even though this is kind of early days here. Um, the other thing, when we have these longitudinal samples, is that we can start to, like I said in the beginning, we can try to infer relationships between cells, proteins, and different cells, and so on. And so this is shown here in this complicated network on the left. Those are all inferred relationships between cells and proteins. And I'm highlighting a few of them here, which shows that if you have very high levels of these chemokines, let's say CCL22, right, you're always gonna be low for these effector CD8 populations and vice versa, um, suggesting that this, this variation is obviously not random. There is structure to all of this variation, and we're just beginning to sort of uncouple some of that. Um, I also wanted to give an example of uh, one clinical study that we've started. This is really just something we're beginning to do, but the idea here is to try to put the immune system measurements that I've just shown you into context 
And here the context would be the microbiome, but most importantly, a tumor. And being a pediatrician, it was easiest for me to do this in children. So we're doing this in the pediatric oncology unit uh, in the hospital where I work. And the point I'm trying to make here is that most often we do these kinds of studies in the context of a trial, right? We typically have a drug that we're testing and during that trial we're measuring something. Um, but what I think we should be doing is we should be thinking about profiling every single patient. Um, and this was what we were trying to do in this study. We tried to basically say every child that comes in treatment, with treatment for a solid tumor, not leukemia, should be profiled. And they should be profiled at the baseline, and then, so that's diagnosis, and then in between every mode of treatment. And why should we be doing this? Well, I think every patient has something to teach us, right? And if we start doing this as a routine, and we start compiling all that data in a database, we're gonna be able to start seeing patterns across patients with different diagnoses, different age, different treatment. There could be common patterns that we can learn which ones are going to have a relapse, which ones are going to have neutropenic fever, which ones are going to have um, other complications, and so on. I think those can be learned, those kinds of issues can be, can be understood by looking at cross-diagnosis. So this is what we really try to do, to set up a system to try to do this routinely in every patient. And um, what are we learning? Well, again, early days, but one, some things we're seeing is that patients, in this case a, a girl with Wilms tumor treated with this combinations of chemotherapies at first. Everybody, I asked my oncology colleagues, so what happens to the immune system when you give this combination of chemotherapy? They said, we have no idea. We, 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 the cells go down. Well, yeah, but you know, in which ones? And, and <clears throat> you know, more details, please. So uh, these are the kinds of questions that we can try to start addressing, right? So if you look at the first two bars there, for example, the neutrophils come down, and they all knew that already, no surprises. But look at eosinophils, for example, it's completely unharmed here. And, and when we're looking within the T-cell populations during these different treatments, there's almost no relative changes at all. So all the T-cells are affected the same way by this particular treatment. Again, uh, I think if we do this in enough number of patients, and, and we start to try to relate this to clinical outcomes and so on, we would be able to lay that puzzle. Um, I'll skip that. And these are the individual, tra sorry, the individual traces for neutrophils, just to show you that if you look in the bottom right, there's these blue individuals with retinoblastoma. They all behave relatively similarly. On the top left, there's a couple of patients with neuroblastoma. Um, they don't really behave the same way. And so, what, how these kinds of things, these kind of traces for every single measurement relate to outcome is, is sort of the game we're trying to play right now. Okay, I, I have to say a few words about newborns because that's sort of my favorite topic to try to understand how newborn immune systems evolve. I talked about this last year and this is published, so I'm not going to go through that, but I'm going to tell you some of the new things we have here. Basically, we're following a bunch of newborns in Sweden, preterms and terms. We've been able to sample them longitudinally, and we published this first report in about six months ago, or almost a year ago. Um, and we followed these children for a longer period now, but this was from the original publication. We basically saw that preterms and terms are very different from the beginning, but they evolve with respect to their immune system through pretty drastic changes during the first weeks of life. Um, and they converge, surprisingly, and, and so that they behave exactly the same. It's basically a response to being born. And it seems to be driven by microbes because of all the changes that are happening. Um, and so what then, what next? Well, what we found is that when we follow them for a longer period, beyond three months, we start seeing something that we think represents stabilization. And so this is what it looks like. These are relative proportions of just a few cell populations. Uh, each stacked bar is a sample, and, and uh, I've removed the cord blood here, so these are all postnatal samples. So if you look at the first sort of three months, which is the uh, most far left one here, there's a lot of changes happening all the time. But around 100 days, when, I, when the black line begins, there's a relative stabilization, and there all the samples are relatively similar to each other, up to about 500 days. 
suggesting that some, there's a very dynamic system in the beginning that stabilizes around 100 days and then, and we're really trying, we're really eager now to figure out what's happening around that time. So the 100 days is an interesting time because there's a lot of epidemiology suggesting that um, events before 100 days could have a critical impact on health long term, even in adulthood. For example, the risk of asthma if you have antibiotics given before 100 days is significantly increased and so on. So something seems to be happening in the immune system. There's a critical period of adaptation and development. Um, and what we're seeing around the 100-day line, which is pretty intriguing to me at least, is that there are these three waves of pretty dramatic changes in immune cell composition in the blood. Um, the first wave is basically a monocyte expansion, which is really transient, but that's sort of the first thing that happens. After that, we see that Tregs, particularly memory Tregs, increase, um, and that is followed by the effector T cells, which also expand. And we're, all, we're looking at clonal expansion to see what they're, if we can figure out uh, whether this is a clonal event or not, clonal expansion or not. Um, we don't know that yet. But basically, there are these three waves. And this is very reproducible in all the children we've looked at, preterms and terms. Um, and there are specific uh, plasma protein events that also precede this 100-day line. We see a sort of expansion of, or sort of upregulation of IL-17 and 8, which are effector molecules produced by T cells, specifically in recognizing uh, bacteria and fungi and so on. So we think this is pretty intriguing. We think, but now I'm speculating and hand-waving a little bit, we think that tolerance is induced around the 100 day and that tolerance is one reason for the stabilization. But that's speculation. So um, we know that the, there, there's a requirement for a certain diversity of the microbiome in the gut from, as measured by fecal samples. And we know that EGF levels in breast milk have to decrease below a certain threshold for this to happen. Um, and, and we think this is all related to the colonization of the microbes, the tolerization of the immune system, and so on. So with that, I'm going to stop here. And uh, just like Moses here, we're trying to separate cells in different you know, patients and try to understand what's happening. Um, and the team that I'm working with is in the top left there. It's just phenomenal. Two of them are here at the meeting, Lakshmi Kant and Yarmi Mikis. Um, and so uh, with that, I can take any questions if you have any.